Dzień dobry. Witamy Państwa bardzo serdecznie na kolejnym wykładzie z cyklu Mistrzowie Architektury. Justyna Boduch i Wojciech Fudala. Mistrzowie Architektury to międzynarodowa seria wykładów architektonicznych odbywających się w Katowicach. Cykl organizowany jest przez Katowicki Oddział Stowarzyszenia Architektów Polskich od 2004 roku. Choć według pierwotnych założeń miał być jedynie serią pięciu wykładów o największych europejskich stolicach, w tym roku będziemy obchodzić dwudziestolecie prowadzenia mistrzów architektury. Wykłady są unikalną atrakcją dla wszystkich interesujących się architekturą i okazją do spotkania wybitnych architektów z całego świata. SARP miał zaszczyt gościć już ponad 70 architektów, wśród nich laureatów Nagrody Priskera oraz Nagrody imienia Wisa, Misa van der Rohe. Każda kolejna edycja stanowi niepowtarzalne forum wymiany pomysłów, projektów i doświadczeń z całego świata. Wykładom często towarzyszą wystawy oraz od 2020 roku właśnie współpracujemy z For Design Days, gdzie otwieramy się na całą Polskę w dziedzinie architektury i designu, zapraszając architektów również do działania i do uczestniczenia w wykładach. Założycielem cyklu był Wojciech Małecki, którego serdecznie witamy i zapraszamy na scenę. Jak to mówią, najważniejsze jest entrée. Także ja się bardzo cieszę w ogóle Wam dziękuję, że ten cykl jest kontynuowany. Pamiętam, Andrzej Duda kiedyś powiedział, że to jest wydarzenie w historii architektury śląskiej, dlatego że trwa tak długo i cyklicznie. Ileś pokoleń zostało jakby wychowanych, a dzisiaj miałem jako nawet myśl, że gdzie miejsce, gdzie jesteśmy, czyli strefa kultury, Prezydent Uszok, którego dzisiaj spotkaliśmy, poprzedni władarz miasta Katowic, on był przez nas bombardowany różnymi tam akcjami z, z SARP-u, ale między innymi zaproszeniami na otwieranie tego cyklu. Wielokrotnie chyba dwa razy otwierał. I może dlatego on tak zaufał Stowarzyszeniu Architektów Polski i zrobił konkursy na świetne budynki, jak ten, w którym jesteśmy, NOSP, Muzeum Śląskie i tak dalej. Także gratulacje dla Was. Gratulacje dla nas i dla wszystkich, którzy przychodzą słuchać wykładu. I dla wszystkich, którzy współpracują przy organizacji. Jeszcze zanim przejdziemy do części oficjalnej, to chciałbym tutaj e, przywitać też gości specjalnych e, dzisiejszego dnia. Przede wszystkim witamy pana Artura Celińskiego, redaktora naczelnego miesięcznika Architektura Murator. Witamy serdecznie i prosimy o brawa. Witamy członków zarządu Stowarzyszenia Architektów Polskich, którzy też tutaj widzę, że przyszli sporą grupą. Chcielibyśmy też przywitać. Well, I, I saw Tina Kortman from UN Studio. I'm not sure if she is uh, still here, but uh, is a partner from UN Studio in Amsterdam. So welcome. <laughs> nice to have you here. I teraz chcielibyśmy poprosić o zabranie głosu prezesa Stowarzyszenia Architektów Polskich Oddział Katowice, Mikołaja Machulika. Dzień dobry, a w zasadzie to już powoli dobry wieczór. Wojtek pięknie tutaj wszystkich przywitał, więc ja jeszcze raz ogólnie E, przywitam wszystkie koleżanki, kolegów, architektów i, i, i państwa zgromadzoną tutaj publiczność. Jak Wojtek wspomniał, już 20 rok z sukcesem organizujemy Mistrzów Architektury w naszym, w naszym stowarzyszeniu. E, I tak się stało już tradycyjnie, że od kilku, od kilku dobrych lat edycji jest to taki otwierający rok e, zawsze co rok na, przy okazji For Design Days. Chciałem jeszcze jako przedstawiciel tutaj organizacji naszej zawodowej 
niejednej, bo również Izby Architektów, zaprosić przy tej okazji Państwa zainteresowanych do udziału w forum, forum Młodej Architektury, w skrócie Forma, tam widać baner po tej stronie sceny, które odbędzie się za trzy tygodnie w, no, w naszym klubu galerii SARP i w nowej przestrzeni D9, do której też zapraszam i zapraszam do korzystania z przestrzeń, którą wspólnie z klubu galerią SARP stworzyliśmy zupełnie nowe miejsce na mapie takiej kulturalnej i biznesowej Katowic. W tym roku oprócz tej nowości mamy jeszcze nowość taką, że powstała baza śląskich architektów, jaka specjalna wizytówka naszych architektów, którzy mogą się tam rejestrować w bazie śląskich architektów i promować swoją twórczość. Dzięki temu my też będziemy to jako Izba Architektów promować i, i lansować. Ale przede wszystkim chciałem powitać również naszego gościa, Anania Singal. Welcome. Brawa. Z całego świata sprowadzamy architektów, więc mnie się udało też, yy, mnie się udało też, yy, tak powiem, rozesłać wici po całym świecie, to znaczy z racji obecnie pracy, którą mam. Yy, rozesłałem do Stanów Zjednoczonych, do, również do Wielkiej Brytanii. W związku z tym też koleżanka mnie prosiła, czy pozdrowie ze sceny moją pracownię, w związku z tym yy, chciałem tak troszkę prywatnie też pozdrowić ze sceny właśnie Departament Architektury Fluor w Gliwicach. No i z tego, że jest transmisja online, są różne strefy czasowe. Mam, mam, na, mam nadzieję, że koledzy ze Stanów też nas oglądają. W związku z tym greetings to architects from architectural departments in Greenville, USA, Fanborough, UK and all architects over the world. Dziękuję. Dziękujemy. Mamy przyjemność i okazję żyć w takich czasach, gdzie y, dzięki mediom społecznościowym nie ma ograniczeń. Dlatego też y, zachęcamy Państwa do śledzenia nas na Facebooku oraz Instagramie. Y, zachęcamy również y, do y, korzystania z naszej strony internetowej, gdzie y, są, mamy wszystkie y, wykłady historycznie oraz na YouTube'a, gdzie pojawiają się relacje z wykładów. Jak co wykład prowadzimy konkurs. Tym razem główną nagrodą w konkursie jest książka cyklów, cyklu Mistrzowie Architektury. Zasady konkursu są proste. Na Instagramie pojawi się post z książką i pod postem należy zadać pytanie do mistrza. W przerwie będziemy, mistrz będzie czytał pytania, wybierzemy najciekawsze z nich i najciekawsze wygrają oto tę książkę. A profil na Instagramie nazywa się Masters of Architecture. I jeszcze dodam, że warunkiem wygrania tej książki jest nie tylko zadanie pytania, ale też zaobserwowanie profilu. Szanowni Państwo, naszym dzisiejszym gościem jest Anania Singal, architekt z Indii, prowadzący własną pracownię studio SAR z oddziałami w Indiach i Wielkiej Brytanii. Studio SAR zostało założone w 2019 roku przez dwójkę partnerów, Ananię Singala i Johnego Baklanda. Ich architektura opiera się w dużej mierze na czynnikach społecznych, takich jak kultura, tożsamość i miejsca, które zostają przełożone na architekturę. Lokalne tradycje inspirują i przekładają się na architekturę współczesności, co prowadzi do innowacyjnych i zróżnicowanych rozwiązań. Wśród najbardziej znaczących realizacji hinduskiej pracowni należy wymienić Sanand Factory, Park Udan czy Centrum Lokalnej Społeczności Third Space. Podczas wykładu w Katowicach Anania Singal przedstawi swoją wizję architektury dla szeroko rozumianego środowiska zbudowanego krajów trzeciego świata. Obok architektury nie zabraknie również odwołań do jego drugiej pasji, jaka, jaką jest fotografia. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, during the last uh, many years, we very often hosted architects from Western Europe and from well-developed countries like Japan, United States, uh, etc. Uh, this year, we would like to focus uh, on so-called Global South. Uh, that's why we have a pleasure of hosting uh, an architect from India, uh, who is our first Hindu architect ever. Uh, so he's going to share with us his vision about uh, the challenges related to designing uh, in the countries of Global South. Mm -hmm. So please welcome and give a big amount of applause to our Master of Architecture, Ananya Singhal. Can you hear me? Uh, I thank Wojciech and Sarp uh, Katowicz for Design Days and the sponsors for the honor of uh, inviting me to this incredible place, uh, this event, and this audience. I thank you, my esteemed colleagues, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I hope I do not bore you over the next 60 minutes. If I do, please shout and I will shut up. I am an unusual architect um, because I span many spheres. I straddled very different worlds. Sometimes I am a client and sometimes I am an architect. Sometimes I'm leading a multinational en engineering and manufacturing company, and sometimes I'm a photographer. Sometimes I'm crafting furniture, and the other times I'm working with engineers and scientists from around the world on software solutions to help reduce energy use and carbon. Sometimes I represent the United Kingdom, which is where I was educated, and sometimes I have the view of the developing world where I was born and where I now work for most of my time. Through this, I have learned that it is important to draw wisdom from many places, from many people, and what I believe strongly is we, if we only draw it from one source, that becomes rigid and it becomes stale. Understanding others will help us become whole. And I think this is why I am particularly grateful to uh, all of you for coming and listening to me today. Having seen the amazing architects who have come and spoken to all of you before me, I can guarantee that I will be different. As I have already explained, diversity is central to my identity. And I hope I can bring you some of that variety today. But now, enough about me, and let us talk about the main course. Amanda Gorman, the US Youth Lo uh, Poet Laureate, said, humility is how we access our humanity, and humanity is how we access hope. I want to talk about building hope, and the architecture and urban fabric for a thriving global south. I am now going to try some uh, a long sentence in Polish. Please forgive me already. So, najem pashhoji pomotsvana duon. With hope comes the helping hand. I have chosen to speak to you with a very big canvas in mind. It may be arrogant for me to think that I can speak with any level of authority on this particular subject, but I do believe it is the most important challenge facing the architectural profession worldwide. I speak of this here because Poland and Polish architects and planners 
have faced similar challenges and can understand, perhaps more than the wealthier Western Europe or Americas, how to solve for these problems. I have been fascinated by the architecture of Poland. Admittedly, I have not seen a lot. This is something I want to correct very soon. The contribution of Polish architects stand out as a testament to the power of creative and context-driven solutions. Polish architects have been making resilient schemes that can adapt to different uses, historical settings, and cultural perspectives. I have fallen in love with your country. For our purposes, I need to define what the Global South is. The Global South refers to those countries that are socio-economically or politically worse off. These are the peoples of Africa, Latin America, large parts of Asia, including my homeland, India. The Global South faces the challenges of climate change, rapid urbanization, extreme poverty, economic disparities, pollution, and poor well-being, all with an intense lack of the capability of investment. It is under attack, and we do not have a complete, coherent, or credible plan to defend ourselves. The future of the planet is dependent on the Global South overcoming this constant threat. This is a chart showing on the z-axis the tax revenues as a percentage of GDP and the GDP per capita. You can see two very clear groupings. The grouping which is richer with more GDP and more tax is the one on the top right hand corner and the grouping at the bottom is the Global South. The other important aspect of the countries of the Global South is that they all have a colonial past. There is no official list of such countries, but this is a loose definition, and it's the one I will use today. I will try my level best not to make this a argument of East versus West, or the Global South versus the richer countries. I do not believe such comparisons are useful to a conversation, and I do not believe that they will result in solutions. Occasionally, though, for those of you who have not come to my country, I might have to bring some comparisons in place to help you understand where I come from. The Global South stands on the precipice. Change on a grand scale is afoot. If we do not oppose the entropy of haphazard and thoughtless growth, we will lose the war to help lift the poor from their misery and to reduce mankind's impact on the world. We, all of us, architects, must form a leadership of humane purpose, a movement from around the world, learning, adapting, and coaxing better cities and buildings to come forth. Surely, we can work a little harder to become brothers and sisters with the entire planet, and in this brotherhood strive, seek, and find within ourselves and together a better future for all. India is at a crossroads. It sits It sits um, at the edge of becoming a developed country. In so many different areas, though, it remains poor. One area where it remains particularly poor is in the number of architects per capita in our country. It is about two orders of magnitude lesser than in Europe. This is a big problem. More people trained to think about space and their urban realm doesn't necessarily make better spaces or schemes or designs, but a huge imbalance is resulting in a thoughtless explosion that will have to be suffered by the people rather than enjoyed, demolished later rather than reused. Udaipur, this is the city I come from. It is a great city with 1.2 million people. It has an urban history that goes back 6,000 years. Udaipur is a rich city with a heritage that is soaked in influences from 
every single culture that it has come across. It is today at a turning point. I will try to use my city as an example because I know it best. I have also had the privilege to work with a team of people who work with me and other responsible citizens who want to help nurture the city and make it a marvel for the future too. I will also try to show how easy it may be to turn the tide in the war and create a truly regenerative cycle of growth and prosperity that allows us to fight the twin enemies of climate change and environmental catastrophe and human suffering through unequal access to service. More than 60% of humankind lives in countries that are still developing. These are the youngest populations on Earth. Their long lives are destined to face a job market affected by the growth of artificial intelligence, polluted and damaged ecosystems, cultures fractured by the pain of colonialism, and the devastation of a post-colonial cultural vacuum. Most of these people live, <coughs> sorry, most of these people live by cities, uh, live in cities by rivers and lakes. It is entirely possible with the rising sea levels. These cities, already under the threat of pollution and unimaginable disparities in service, will be under a new assault, that of unstoppable and rising water. It does seem like a bleak prognosis for the future. I would like to emphasize that the most challenging battles against climate change will be fought here, not in Europe, but in the global south. The world will succeed or fail in its fight to prevent irreparable damage only if we are unable, only if we are able to come together with great earnestness and resolve to revolutionize the built environment and urban fabrics of the cities and towns of Asia, Africa, Central and Southern America. Economically, the Indian government gets about $1,200 per capita of tax revenue. In comparison, the British government gets about $9,500 uh, US dollars, and the European Union gets about $16,200 per capita. Right out of the gate, we understand a huge difference between the global south and the global north. The countries of the Global South and their governments cannot do everything that the Global North does. We must rely on private spending to make sure that we can result in a better world. A solution that relies on heavy government infrastructure or projects with funding from a government levy cannot work. Large metro or transportation projects to fuel this rise in urban population, centralized sewage treatment plants to deal with the fact that there is so much more uh, human beings in within cities, and large en energy distribution will come at a huge cost. They will not deliver until a vast amount of capital has been put in and will not be conducive to other problems in the global south. The problem of pollution, of traffic, and of poor working conditions will not be changed unless we think of a new way of doing things. With more than 52% of the population already living in urban areas and millions being added every year, 
This rate of growth compounds, is compounded by capitalistic opportunism that results, that prevents a clear vision for a town or city to be played out. One in seven, mil, one in seven of the people on this planet are migrants. Currently, there are 763 million internal migrants worldwide. Most of these are in the global south. Urbanization is a global truth, and India's urban population grows by 8% every year, and the rural population is shrinking. Cities are where the fight for survival will take place. This is the re India's result of growth. The average age of people in within the global south is 32 years old with many African countries, the median age being 22 to 25, and a rapidly growing population. In the developed world, the average is north of 45. While richer countries battle with ideas about pension ages, ages of retirement, and the needs of older people to be more productive, in the global south, we need to find young to find good work, to build careers and create wealth that will fuel a drastic improvement in their quality of life. Modern solutions in the west are all focused on reducing the labor requirement to work. Unfortunately, that's what happens when you reduce labor requirement to work. Deskilling and automation, work by machines, automate, automatons, are not by people. The opportunity offered by lower labor cost in the global south must be fully exploited to spread wealth to the whole community. Commerce and business and getting people to do things is key. Much of the global south is also the cradle of ancient societies and civilizations on Earth. It is an ironic twist of history that lands with the greatest stress today are the ones with the most glorious past. The nations and peoples from the global south are a vibrant tapestry of cultures, histories, religions, and traditions. Tapping into this rich history and heritage without the filter of a conventional mindset can begin to correct the failings of the past. We must frame solutions for these unique places with the deepest care to accentuate their unique identities. Solutions that work in Geneva will not work in Jaipur. When we try to import solutions from Western Europe and North America to India and Africa, we bring with these the solutions all the problems they created there and add new problems here. Cities with expressways, which you've already seen before, and a car-centric world cannot be possibly a solution for a world fighting to free itself from the scourge of fossil fuels. Neither can cycling everywhere in 45 degrees centigrade and 90% humidity. There is a vacuum of ideas and vision, a crisis caused by callousness and corrosive carelessness. With humanity is under such an attack from all sides, we either unite or we fail. Biodiversity is critical to successfully facing off the threat of climate change. Preserving and ensuring the local flora and fauna that has evolved to sustain itself in the climates and those conditions are central to creating the most bang for buck when it comes to green spaces and fighting the health costs of pollution. We do not know what we put at risk when we decided to unthinkingly introduce non-native species. In India, for example, we are still recovering from the heavy plantation of Australian eucalyptus all over the subcontinent. And the same is true with Africa. What was considered good work 
in the mid 20th century has today replaced dense and complicated ecosystems of rainforests in Uganda, Rwanda, Congo with hectares of monoculture. This monoculture, in India at least, has helped kill off the balance between termites and ants, humanity, dragonflies, and mosquitoes, and other such features of a natural ecosystem. More mosquitoes have led to a huge health crisis of malaria, dengue, chikungunya, and other diseases. Of course, we can't blame the mosquitoes just on the spreading monocultures. There are other reasons for it. Very soon I will come to something positive, but before that, one last thing. I use the analogy of war when I talk about the fight against poverty in the global south. I use it, and I know with Poland's history and the proximity of Ukraine, you know more about the ravages of war than I do. Yet, this war is necessary. And through the midst of uncertainty and the chaos of the battlefield, it will be the actions of many from around the world that will result in a prosperous and safer Earth. The question is, what do we do? As you know, as we know, how cities and our places are made profoundly affects our health and well-being. As makers of space, we control how people feel in spaces and therefore how they emote and behave. We can make spaces that calm people, like Humayu's tomb or the Pantheon of Rome. We can make pieces that excite people, like sports stadiums. We can create environments of learning and of care, and in skilled hands, the tools of architecture can raise a population from despair to grace. Architecture is also the symbol of oppression and cultural cleansing. We see this in the colonial architecture of the global south, fascist and communist architecture in Europe and the West. Through the world architecture, around the world, architecture has perpetuated the collapse of native cultures and pervaded the colonial influences of foreign rulers far beyond their rule in both space and time. As the global south urbanizes, quality of life must improve, not deteriorate. It is a shame to all humanity that so many of our brothers and sisters live in the squalor and pallid horrors of favelas, hutments, and slums. People are leaving their rural homes to find a better economic future in cities, but actually they suffer working 16 hour days and sending their earnings back home. Work cannot be shied away from, earnings must be earned. Without a tax supported social security net and growing populations, the city in the global south must become <clears throat> havens of employment, skill generation, OECs knowledge where people can come, grow, and take knowledge further and spread the light. What are the solutions, you say? This diagram tries to explain one of the problems. Today, the West has propagated the idea of big is best. In reality, a paradigm I will keep coming back to is the idea of small but many. We need to bring together a world of small towns rather than few large metropolises. Metropolises like Delhi and Bombay of 36 million people. I would say the era of great metropolises is over and the era of, era of interconnected towns is upon us. And with the influx of better connectivity between cities and towns, surely the solution for the future is extremely well connected with transport and communication, towns that allow people to live in places where the most distant urban feature is 30 minutes away, where traffic is almost non-existent and green spaces are not oases, but vast oceans and rivers of oxygen and serotonin generating landscapes. Can we have smaller cities, but many? These cities need to be connected not only by aviation, railways and roads, but also by an information superhighway that allows remote working, collaboration and learning. There should be enough employment opportunities in each city, sufficient learning resources, and excellent health infrastructure that is locally grown and developed. Cities of maybe a million, two million people, and 10 million to 20 million trees, surrounded by the local flora and fauna, and yet not an island, but an interwoven series of small cities. We need to find a new route to create the accessible city understand the vernacular, and build on the sense of community that already exists. Dispensing, 
as the West has with archaic ideas of zoning, putting the workplace far away from home, and putting that far away from where you shop. We have seen the world over the failure of these ideas. I was talking earlier uh, about the failure of the Corbusian ideal. We need to be able to look deep into the cultures of the global south and find live-work accommodation used to be what 80 to 90% of the urban realm was. Work, education, health, and commerce, that is all within reach, creates a truly accessible city, whether it is hot outside, wet, or cold. In warmer climates, we need to bring together pedestrian systems, which urban transportation, and shade and greenery, reintroducing biodiversity and enhancing the existing diversity in our urban fabrics. For too long, we have tried to emulate the West in driving away all that is natural, what is thought to be the chaos of nature and retain only what man has defined and formed. Is there not a way for us to bring native culture and nature and native people in harmony? Can we not have smaller city modules, but many? I will shut up for a few seconds and let you watch this video. Access to nature is a vital part of happy and healthy city living. Some municipalities, however, find it hard to give access to a garden or green space to all of their citizens, and densely populated centres struggle most. So what does the city do if they don't have large empty patches of land to turn over to nature? You're listening to Tall Stories, a monocle production brought to you by the team behind The Urbanist. I'm Andrew Tuck. In this episode, Ananya Singhal of Studio Saar takes us on a tour of this firm's recently completed Lakeside Pocket Park in the Indian city of Udaipur. Uran Park is a just about 2,000 square meter urban park. It was a little bit of leftover space, which is owned by the municipal government of Udaipur. Successive local governments have tried to make it into a public park. We were given the opportunity to create a small little park as an example to the city that people can come in in public-private partnership, create small parks, and re-green the city of Udaipur in India. As you approach Oran Park, to the left is a small gate made out of reinforcement bars for the construction sites, which have been formed into branches and leaves. Open the gate, and you have a choice either to go down a ramp or down some stairs. If you go down the ramp, you are head towards a labyrinth of local foliage and plants which have been planted into tires which have been disposed of thrown away. You go through the landscape of these native plants. They're flowering at different times, some are fragrant. And then you approach, at the end of the labyrinth, a large canopy which overlooks the lake. And the canopy is made up of close to 36,000 silhouettes of starlings to mimic a murmuration which happens regularly over the lakes. Around the canopy there are places for you to sit, relax, you can play a game of chess. Again, the chess pieces have been made from repurposed bits of metal. You can play some local Indian games and then we designed a set of swings and what's really cool about these is we again reused old bits of steel as well as rope, which is made out of recycled or reused saris. A huge part of what we wanted to do with the whole park was to create many examples how it's not expensive to create public spaces. Actually, you can reuse and repurpose lots of waste material and thereby bring the actual costs down. This park, Oran, is really important to the city of Udaipur because Udaipur is a beautiful city. We're surrounded by these amazing lakes. We're nestled in the Aravli Hills. Unfortunately, though, the town no longer has accessible green spaces. In terms of green cover around the city, you probably have four square meters per citizen of Udaipur. But if I found accessible green public park spaces, it would probably be down to either an A3 or an A4-sized piece of paper, so it's a really, really small amount. As a result, most social activity takes place on the roadside. And as the city becomes denser and more populated, obviously roadside social activity is in constant conflict with transportation. Now, as a city, we are 
not able to find huge tracts of green land that we can suddenly convert into green space. But the city has lots and lots of little pockets of either community gardens, derelict sites, publicly owned sites, but at the moment unused, which could be converted to small parks, which would bring open green spaces within walking distance to every citizen and thereby enabling us to get to a point where citizens and visitors actually have access to parks. Some of the innovations that we came up with, which is very different from Indian parks, is we focused on native flora and that enabled native fauna to come back in. For the most part, when private companies sponsor parks, they tend to want to create a branding opportunity and therefore they want to create spaces which have lots of trees and plants which are from faraway places which look beautiful and stunning but nonetheless aren't native in nature and we kind of reverse that to say let's try to bring back a lot of the native species the other thing we did the canopy that we created it was a really wonderful project in terms of working together with the engineers and creating something sculptural and dynamic the columns mimic trees and the birds are flying within them it was a real challenge to get it built because we were building it during COVID and the contractors found it very, very hard to make it. But nonetheless, now it looks really good out there in terms of becoming a part of the local atmosphere. We're very lucky that we're working with a wonderful non-governmental organization called the Rover. And one of the Rover's three missions is to get the city of Udepo and the community to plant and nurture a million trees around the district. And when we were strategizing with them about how to get the city and the citizens engaged in this process, we realized we have to create examples of how to do this. And as a result, we have focused on delivering at least three more parks. The Ruhr and the Slack Bridge also are rewilding about 85 acres of hillside, and they're reforesting something like 25 acres of hillside. So there's that progress also taking place in terms of getting the green belt around the city revitalized. With the local government now convinced, they have begun to find other parcels of land and involve other companies in this way. We have perhaps initiated a quiet revolution, one where small but many parks will form a network of accessible green spaces in Udaipur. So this is Gulab Vatika. Um, there used to historically be a rose garden here, um, and we worked with the government to rebring roses uh, to this garden. So there are about 200 different species of roses at the Gulab Vatika, from all the way around India, and some from overseas. And it really shows the difference between what Indian culture um, likes about roses and what the Western culture likes. Indian roses are all small in nature with a beautiful smell and the roses that you'd get in the West would be pretty large, beautiful aesthetically, visually, uh, but not necessarily with that typical smell of a rose that you get. I'd like to now quickly talk about some other architects who either did do an amazing job of redefining India for India. So one of them is my mentor um, and hero, Balakrishna Doshi, who through projects like Gufa in the Ahmedabad, uh, rediscovered the ancient shelters of our deep ancestors. Doshi is my hero. He was steeped in culture and wisdom of India. 
he deeply understood our people and was able to bring together and meld the Western thinking of architecture that he was trained in, and so am I, with what we identified with deep in our hearts in India. His buildings and spaces did not shy away from the complexity that is normal in Indian culture. They embraced color, texture, complexity, layering while remaining informed by the modern movement. People like his son-in-law, Rajiv Katpalya, through Flame University, thought of the idea of a bazaar of ideas and knowledge, a street scene, if you will. His inspiration for Nalanda University, which was one of the world's first universities and destroyed by raiding colonials. He is trying to rebuild that. Or Hassan Fatih from the Middle East. Here you see him trying to strive for a new identity that can be enforced by architecture. In designing Third Space in Udaipur, we also chose to go back to the inspiration from stepwells, townhouses, palaces that exist in our state. Our inspirations were aesthetic, climatic, material, and emotionally taken from Udaipur and the architectural heritage in our region. Modern technology blended with traditional solutions and an aesthetic sense of volume and color that merged influences from a thousand years of history. We tried to establish a sense of volume and color that merged all of these influences and create an identity for the building that the residents of Udaipur would recognize as theirs.
This is Third Space. Um, it is a unique project uh, which brings together uh, activities, science, uh, art, creativity, and curiosity. Uh, it's been a very interesting project for us to build, and one that is being built for the people of Udaipur so that the young can become more creative, more curious, and do things more with their own hands. It's a challenging project for the Western mindset because we use a lot of concrete, we use a lot of steel, we use a lot of marble. Um, we have a lot of open spaces. Uh, but it is inspired by everything that Indian people recognize. One of the interesting things we discovered through the making of this was that we need to th change the way we think about problems. Traditionally, there is a linear approach, a problem, a fix, and a solution. We need to change this. In embracing complexity, the great thinkers of India's past have found already, well before the West did, that the Earth revolved around the Sun. They accurate, accurately calculated the dimensions of the Earth 3,000 years ago and knew that the Earth was a sphere. By embracing complexity in the 1500s, Indian weavers made fabric that went all the way across the Indian Ocean, across Africa to Timbuktu, where new designs and new fashion was created and returned. This is all before globalization. We already talked about a lot of complex problems that we need to solve. We cannot do this one by one, and every solution and action will have to have more than one purpose. And therefore, I invite everyone to think about network thinking as the best way to change the way we deliver projects. This is extremely hard to execute. In order to solve for all the variables, it is critical to constantly evolve solutions, reiterate, and change. We need to weigh the solutions against a changing set of goals. Many cultures in the world build people with the right skill sets for multinodal thinking like this. When done right, it can bring joyful architecture that solves multiple problems at once. In fact, as architects, when we do great buildings, we do this well. Laurie Baker is a Indian architect with a Western name. Unfortunately, he passed away, but he worked very hard to create a sustainable social identity for India. In Africa, Kerry architecture did the same thing. In order to be sustainable, we need to be able to put all the inputs, the site, the brief, the client, the context, with all the challenges, biodiversity loss, land, water and air pollution, climate change and poor access to services, lack of funding, employment and growth opportunities, and a chasm between those who have and those who do not, and find ways of converting some of them to opportunities. For those of us who do this as architects, we must educate our clients, regulators and governments, that progress and development are to be embraced, that innovation is to be rewarded. At the moment, for the most part, in every country in the world, it is regulated against. We must realize that in balancing in the balancing acts, we might some things might lose and some things may not. But our goal must to go from being architects and designers who think through fully considered projects and make sure that the positive impact happens in more and more places. In the view of our practice, this happens when we combine context, community, and cost together. I would now like to quickly talk about Secure Sanand. Something that architects in the West have stopped to do is to really focus on making the places where we make things beautiful and wonderful and great places to work. Most of our lives are spent in the workplaces we create. Unfortunately, Architects around the world are more focused on creating museums uh, and celebrate art galleries far more than our workplaces. 
I would encourage every one of us to go find those sheds in our industrial landscape and do better for them. We believe in community-centric architecture. And in the factory, we designed the canteen to be the most beautiful building of them all, a volume which enabled workers coming out of the factory to actually find joy and comfort. This is what the factory looks like. The factory has 100% natural light in the day. And what we found compared to our other factories was the fact that this factory with 100% natural light has fewer people leaving uh, less attrition in within the factory. The quality in within this factory is marginally better than the quality in other factories. By designing for the people and making sure that actually people feel happy in their surroundings, by making sure there is enough green space, we are able to create an environment which is actually more productive. Our clients on seeing this and seeing the metrics that go with it are now convinced that good, high quality built environment which is centered around the people who work there is critical to success. I would just like to bring some other architects from around the world to mind. This is Peter Rich who is discovering a new world for Southern Africa. This is Vinu Daniels in southern India, who is creating new craft from bricks and locally found materials. Here is another image of his work. This is the image of Anupama Kundu, who now teaches in Germany but continues to build in India. What is common amongst all of this work is the championing of craftsmanship, the act of making and the human touch. By creating buildings and using technology that needs to be crafted, we choose to solve the local impairment of employment, reduce waste, and use materials and technology developed in and creating a local aesthetic, a local culture, and a return to some of the traditions that we have lost. Alongside all this, we find that we create a cadre of creative makers who can take their newfound skills to create a built fabric industry that will be ready for a labor crunch when it comes. Here you see a lady putting together a cane uh, sheet. We are using this cane sheet in third space to create a canopy. This canopy is designed to break down and need changes. It is designed to be resilient through damage. What we will need to do is we will need to hire and maintain a group of people who will continuously make new woven sheets. This is far cheaper and far more carbon, uh, has far low, lower carbon content than trying to create something which is permanent. We had used this in a canopy uh, pavilion in London over the summer. Today, we hire and train skilled craftsmen. They are working with the finest opportunities of skill. And some of the people who we train and develop have gone back into the community and formed their own businesses, creating an ecosystem in Udaipo that is slowly becoming unparalleled. We are doing the same thing with carpenters, lime plaster makers, inlaid tile layers, weavers, painters, and every single other type of worker. This growing group of skilled craftsmen and women will enable us to dare more and push our architectural solutions more. You'll be happy to know I'm coming to the end of this presentation. As I close, I would just like to remind you of the few things we discussed. Regenerative architecture and solutions are critical. Craft, buildings and spaces, use hand to use your hands and create an army of skilled workers. <coughs> Try to recreate a post-colonial identity for the people of the Global South, one in which they believe and become self-confident in themselves. These solutions you can find through time. 
we need to work for the community and make it primarily about the community. And finally, if you think through all the problems with all the variables that we face and all of our tools involving network thinking, we can perhaps come to a beautiful and better future for the global south. Hope is an emotion. Hope is innate to humanity. Hope makes us human. Hope needs to be nurtured. Through desperation and fear, through the existential anxieties of our age, we need to foster hope worldwide. Hope can be rekindled fastest where the light of its, where its light is diminished the most. With architects and designers guiding the flames, with the greatest of care, with hope in their own hearts, and hope in all of their actions. I envisage a future where the cities of the Global South are not just surviving, but thriving. Where architecture and urban planning are tools for social, environmental, economic transformation. This future is within our reach, and it is, starts with us here today. Thank you for your patience and time. Thank you very much, Ananya. Uh, indeed, uh, I can say without doubt that uh, it was totally different uh, presentation than all the lectures we had uh, previously. Uh, now we would like to ask you to select uh, the most interesting question because people during your speech, people were asking questions. Uh, so you can join Justin Nader. She will show you the questions uh, that people sent us. Um, i teraz przecież czas na rozstrzygnięcie konkursów. W zasadzie możemy już włączyć światła na sali, e, zarówno na scenie, jak i na, na widowni. E, I w tej chwili e, przyszedł czas na rozstrzygnięcie konkursu z Petra Lany, konkursu wizytówkowego. Więc ja chciałbym ponownie zaprosić tutaj na scenę przedstawicieli firmy, e, którzy rozstrzygną konkurs. W tej chwili przeprowadzimy losowanie. E, I dwie osoby spośród tych, które biorą udział w konkursie, wygrają atrakcyjne nagrody ufundowane przez firmę Petra Lana. I może zaprosimy też prezesa SARP, Mikołaja Machulka, który będzie losował. Oczywiście wełna jest zareglamentowana tylko po jednej płycie. I rozpoczynamy losowanie. Wszyscy widzą, że nie oszukuję? Nie wiadomo, nie wiadomo, dobrze. Okej, okay, proszę. Otóż e, zwycięzcą e, naszego e, konkursu jest pani Marika Micyk. Zapraszamy serdecznie. I gratulujemy. Warto mieć szczęście. Szczęście się uśmiechnęło. Dziękuję. Gratuluję. Ja sobie z panią zdjęcie zrobię. Moja córka też ma na imię Marika i nikt nie wierzy, że takie imiona są. Także potem sobie zrobimy zdjęcie, pokażę. Ile jeszcze mamy? Jedną, tak? Jeszcze. Tak, została jeszcze jedna nagroda. I zwycięzcą drugiej nagrody została pani Paulina Olsz Olszakowa. Olszówka chyba. Olsz Olszówka, tak, przepraszam najmocniej. Pani Paulina Olszówka. Gratulujemy. Także jeszcze raz dziękujemy serdecznie firmie Petra Lana. Eee, I teraz przyszedł czas na rozciągnięcie naszego drugiego konkursu. Eee, so I hope that uh, Anania has already selected the most interesting questions. Uh, are you ready with the selection? Uh, okay, so please uh, come, on, come, to the, come to the stage. I teraz zaczniemy konkurs. Dziękujemy. Rozstrzygniemy teraz konkurs, w którym autorzy najciekawszych pytań zostaną magazynami książkami 
o cyklu Mistrzowie Architektury. Gdyby ktoś chciał, to może też poprosić naszego mistrza o dedykację na książce. Oczywiście ci, którzy później zakupią książki też przy naszym stoisku, również będą mieli możliwość zdobycia podpisu i dedykacji od naszego mistrza architektury. Ok, so this is the time to, to, to announce the winners. Ok. Dziękujemy, dziękujemy bardzo za tak liczne wzięcie udziału. Jeśli chodzi o kolejność, nie ma ona tutaj znaczenia. Po kolei Paweł Ryszard. Do you think that creating ecological architecture in European way of thinking can result in the same problems in the future like colonialism in the past? Is it possible that the ecology should be resolved in a different way in poorer countries and the richer ones? Zapo zapraszamy Pawła. Czy jest autor pytania na sali? To zapraszamy na scenę. Oklaski. Aplauz, please. I dodatkowo nagroda od firmy Aliplast. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want a signature on the yes, book? Of yes, of okay, so before you answer, yeah, you okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there we go. I think that here is the better place. So. Uh, the answer lies in the fact that I, I think the West has done a bad job of preserving its ecology. Today in, in Europe, in England, in Scotland, you no longer have the predators that we have, uh, that you used to have. There used to be wolves, and there used to be bears, and there used to be dangerous animals. You've gotten rid of all of them. Uh, most of your forests are not actually natural forests. They are mostly man-made forests. In the UK especially, 99% of the forest and the trees have all been humanly planted. And therefore, the way ecology and diversity and biodiversity has to be treated in the global south, where we still have dangerous animals living in within millimeters of each other, of humanity, uh, has to be different. And in reality, that is what is actually happening in, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, and in, and in India itself. We have to find a new way of living with a very diverse, biologically diverse uh, group of uh, flora and fauna. And uh, so you see, you know, on YouTube, once in a while, you will see pictures of uh, movies of leopards and tigers in within our cities. Uh, you will see lions in, in within African cities. This is not uncommon. And therefore, we have to have a different way of treating our wildlife, and actually we do. I was just in Uganda um, in December, and it was wonderful to see uh, how they are resolving the dichotomy of human development alongside um, in ensuring that the biodiversity is preserved. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, the uh, next question. Taka uh, Tarutka, Weronika Kolaska. Zapraszamy Polska. na scenę, jeśli autorka pytania jest tutaj. I gratulujemy. Gratulujemy. Is there was a chance uh, would you choose your origin and profession again and try to fight for a better tomorrow or would you rather be born, live and work in the north and not think about the problems of the south, have greater opportunities and is of work? Gratuluję jeszcze tutaj dla autorki pytanie będzie też nagroda od firmy Rehau. So actually I had that opportunity. I uh, was educated in the UK. Um, I still have a home in the UK. I have um, the second part of my life aside from being an architect. Uh, I'm a I, I run a very large multinational business along with my brother, and there are 200 employees of ours in the UK. 
I had the opportunity to live in the UK. I chose to go back to India. I chose to, uh, and my brother did, as did my sister. All of us, we were all educated in the UK. We all had an opportunity to be in the UK. Um, for us, uh, our impact and our agency in, in India is so much greater. Uh, the positive qualities of what we can do is so much greater that we never even thought once about staying in the Global North. We continue to, to operate in the Global North, but our entire intention is to help solve some of the problems in, within India itself. Thank you. Woźniak mm, Domin. Do you think that with progress... Zapraszam, zapraszam od razu tutaj. Do you think that with uh, progress dies the uh, craftsmanship of yesterday like uh, masonry and we should preserve some of it uh, by using in the new projects? Gratulujemy. Gratulacje. So maybe you can answer the question first uh, and then we will give the prize. Uh, so I don't think with progress it needs to die. Um, this is a choice that again, the West has made. Uh, it's not a choice that India needs to make. It's not a choice the Global South needs to make. Uh, I think we choose to make labor expensive. We choose to make skills hard to get. Um, and I, I think in the future, definitely, there will be opportunities for skills to exist, for uh, craft to exist alongside with progress. Gratulacje i jeszcze nagroda od firmy Aliplast. Także serdecznie gratulujemy. Mm, tutaj mamy tylko y, imię. Adam Ryks. Przeczytam, przeczytam pytanie. How did working with B. V. Doshi, the Pritzker Prize laureate, influence your professional and maybe personal development? So, um, firstly, I had uh, uh, I was going to pursue a master's degree in Switzerland, uh, which he convinced me not to do, and he convinced me to start my practice. Uh, so that was a big personal impact that uh, he had on me. But I think, secondly, you know, this combination of Western thinking and Indian spiritualism, uh, this notion that you need to be really mindful of the users and make sure that you're always leaving your buildings ready to be changed, um, that, that was critical in his mind and something that he kept bouncing back to me and something which remains in, in my head. So yeah, ha he has had a profound impact on me professionally and personally both. Thank you. Gratulujemy. Mieliśmy dzisiaj liczną ekipę z firmy Knau, więc e, tak jak statystyka wykazała, e, jedna z nagród wędruje właśnie do firmy Knauf. Jeszcze jedna. I dodatkowo nagroda firmy Rechał. Gratulujemy. And the last one, uh, Zosia Beckman. <coughs> we invite uh, Zosia. Uh, but uh, the question is uh, very similar, uh, like Daniel Alka. <laughs> so, uh, Daniel, uh, congratulations too. <laughs> we send you a book. We, we have only five, but we have uh, your address. So <laughs> I uh, I think that Dan already has our book, <laughs> so so it's fine. <laughs> um, the question uh, is, uh, Zosia, how does the photography passion affect on your design process? Daniel, do you think architecture and photography have anything in common?
jeszcze I feel like a celebrity. Adidas, także gratulujemy. Oh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, you know, um, so all of that photography that you saw, that was all my photography. Um, architecture and photography is similar because they are both about playing with space, light, volume, texture. Um, most of my photography is black and white. Um, and the structure is something that I bring to architecture, and I think the architectural knowledge is something I bring to my photography. Uh, they're interlinked. I, I think I would need a lot of introspection to understand what has affected what and in how many ways. Uh, but you know, my camera is never more than two meters away from me, and neither is a pencil or a scale rule. They, they're both, all these things, I pretty much sleep with them. Um, and they do have a really profound impact on, on how I see space. It's probably better to ask this question from Johnny because he has to deal with, uh, so Johnny is my creative director at Studio Sa, and he has to deal with all the craziness that I bring uh, to the studio every day. So he's probably the guy who's going to answer that question more than I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was the last prize. But uh, if anyone else would like to ask a question by yourself, uh, you can raise your hand uh, and you can do it now. Uh, by yourself. So if there is anyone brave, gdyby ktoś miał jakieś pytanie, które chciałby jeszcze zadać, to teraz jest moment, żeby zrobić to osobiście. To ja podejdę z mikrofonem. Okay, hello again. Uh, I have some simple question. Uh, are there some uh, lessons, harsh lessons that you see uh, that are came from note uh, th those countries that you don't want to repeat in the south uh, when we talk about architecture? Oh, so you're going to get me to criticize the West after all. <laughs> um, I think the, the biggest lesson, the harshest question that we need to think about is this idea that you know, linear thinking or solving one problem at a time is the way to go. Um, unfortunately, uh, I don't think we have the time um, with biodiversity loss and with climate change occurring the way it is occurring and with the amount of poverty in the global south that we can do this one solution at a time method. Um, we have to find ways of working together with all the complexity, embracing complexity in a way which, uh, you know, Western logical thinking has for a long time said we should not do. I, I sincerely believe probably in the global south, the way to solve problems is to accept more problems and solve them all as much as possible in, in together. Um, and well, you know, what that means is uh, is that cities and architecture and form in, in the global south will be very different from the west, and it should be. Hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my question was not chosen, but I will not give up. <laughs> like <laughs> you were saying about this uh, smaller groups which work better than bigger metropolis. And uh, do you think that there is possibility to rearrange the big cities which we are living now to regroup on a smaller pieces which will uh, self-exist um, to not remove the big cities by itself, because it's already built, so it would be a waste to demolish everything to build again some smaller groups. I agree. It would be a waste to demolish the big cities. I don't think... Um, can you hear me? Uh, I don't think uh, we should demolish the big cities. But the key question is, how should we be encouraging new cities? At the moment in the Global South, uh, the big cities are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and the smaller cities are growing at a much slower pace. 
we need to flip that. We need our smaller cities to grow at bigger pace, at faster pace, uh, in a more structured way uh, to make sure that they can compete for employment and for resources with the bigger cities. Um, what that'll mean, once the smaller cities start to become more attractive, they will become places where people will want to come and automatically you'll see a shift. I don't think regulation needs to make this happen. And I definitely do not believe that some form of Baron Hausman type demolishing half of Delhi would work either. Um, I think that is actually a very bad idea. Um, so I would say all we need to do is encourage the growth of smaller cities and allow then the market forces to take over. If you had employment and good schooling and good healthcare in a smaller city with less pollution and less traffic, you would choose a smaller city. Um, you would not choose to go to a Delhi which has uh, pollution so high that European metrics uh, do not even cover that area. Uh, that invariably some people are traveling in within the city two or three hours one direction to get to their place of work. These things are unreasonable uh, if we as architects start to propose smaller cities to get more investment, automatically this shift will take place. And the big cities can carry on being big, but we can end up with 200 smaller cities which are well connected and are the desirable places to live. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else, any more questions? Anyone else interested uh, in another topic? Okay. <laughs> okay, that's a long way. <laughs> a lot of steps. Thank you very much for your lecture. It was a really um, big pleasure to uh, to listen this kind of. Um, a uh, story from the Global South. Actually, I uh, work on uh, African architecture. And uh, I asked a question on Instagram about uh, the new megapolis in West uh, Africa. What is your opinion about this uh, situation? It seems like um, it's uh, the big uh, wave of uh, uh, connecting big cities in the West Coast of uh, Africa. Uh, it's contrary to your um, your opinion about small cities and how we should develop small cities. Could you reflect on this uh, topic uh, on big cities and megapolis uh, projects in uh, Africa? I, I, would, I am very interested in this topic and I, I would be delighted to hear your um, answer. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the billions and billions of dollars that are going to have to be spent to make a huge city work uh, could be better invested in smaller cities. It's just a case of, you know, um, a big mass transportation system which would be required in even, let's take Neom City as an example in, in South Saudi Arabia. Uh, you could build maybe 20 cities with better quality of life um, with the amount of money that Neom City will take. And uh, the resultant... Uh, travel times, for example, will be less. The result in pollution will be less. The access to nature will be greater. Uh, the ability to, to live and work has changed very dramatically today with good communications and the ability to do business remotely. I, there is no reason to have huge cities anymore. Um, and so therefore, from an African perspective, I find it very challenging to understand why you would uh, spend the money on such such large cities. Large cities have problems. Uh, even the richest countries in the world have not been able to solve the problems of large cities. You look at the difficulties in New York and Tokyo and you know the big cities of the world, we do not have a answer at the moment to how to make them more comfortable and livable. We have answers on how to make cities of one, two, three million people livable. Now I know three million cities is not a small city in, in, in Europe, but for the rest of the world, it is a medium-sized city. And, and in my view, uh, just in terms of uh, investment and return on investment, uh, smaller cities would be better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
I think that was the last question. Uh, so once again, Ananya, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much for making time to come here for your long way. It was 30 hours of traveling yeah, and six different cities, as I know. Uh, so really appreciate that. Uh, so thanks again. And uh, I know that that's not uh, your last uh, intervention during uh, this for design Then conference. Uh, so now I'll tell in Polish. Uh, it's, uh, Jutro zapraszamy też na kolejne wydarzenia w ramach For Design Days i jutro o 15 nasz mistrz architektury poprowadzi też warsztaty fotograficzne tutaj w MCK. I to będą takie półtore, znaczy to, będzie godzin, to będą to godzinne warsztaty z fotografii architektonicznej, które Anania Singal poprowadzi wspólnie z Danem Alką, naszym fotografem, który tam właśnie teraz wchodzi z aparatem. Natomiast później to będzie między 15 a 16, a później między 16 a 16.30 już odbędzie się rozmowa o fotografii architektonicznej, w której wezmą udział właśnie Dan Alka, Anania Singal i Robert Konieczny. Więc jeśli ktoś jest jeszcze zainteresowany też tą drugą stroną działalności naszego mistrza architektury, nie tylko architekturą, ale też fotografią, to serdecznie zapraszamy na jutro. It was amazing lecture, big applause, please. Thank you.